All right, so this is the second half of my uh, collection here. So let's go ahead and start. The first one on this list is a uh, watch that I purchased uh, earlier this year. Uh, it's a uh, Casio G-Shock uh, DW5600 series watch. Uh, I think it's really interesting in the fact that uh, it's a Casio. I don't own many quartz watches and um, you know it has this sort of uh, tan color uh, with the negative display and the, the sort of camo section as well. I just thought it was really interesting. Uh, it also comes with a, um, a fabric strap that you can put on it as well. And uh, you know, this is a, a fun watch. I just like to wear, you know, when I'm working in the yard or taking the dogs for a walk. I don't have to worry about getting this thing dinged up or whatever. Uh, I'm a strong believer that everyone should have at least one or two, uh, you know, uh, digital watches in their collection that are beaters. You know, if they, if if something goes wrong, um, you know, you, you're not going to be worried about damaging it. And so, you know, these are only around a hundred dollars. I just think it's a really neat watch, and I really do enjoy wearing this one quite a lot. All right, the next one on this list is a Timex Ironman Triathlon. Uh, I actually purchased this one around um, 15 years ago when I was living in Tokyo, um, and uh, you know I saw this in a shop window, and uh, man, it just brought back so many memories for me. I used to own this exact model watch when uh, when I was in um, middle school and high school. And uh, you know, I, I just remember um, thinking, "Oh man, this is just such a neat watch." Back then, um, you know, and and uh, you know, I always enjoyed wearing a watch. And and uh, this Iron Man triathlon, I think, just really spoke to me at the time because of the the color pattern. I mean, it's got this sort of gray um, case with these black and orange and white accents. Uh, you know, it's just really interesting and kind of funky. You know, very. Um, very much a, a time of the, uh, very much a watch of the 1980s and the early 1990s. And so I just keep this one around just to uh, remember, you know, what sort of got me into watches in the first place. And, and uh, you know, I, I do enjoy wearing this one every so often as well. Again, probably just when I'm uh, kicking around, you know, walking the dog or something like that. Um, I probably wouldn't wear this one much more than uh, just doing chores around the house or something like that. But it is fun to wear from time to time. All right, this next one on the list here is a uh, Zen uh, 144. Uh, this particular watch I uh, purchased around five years ago. And um, I've always been very much interested in PVD coated watches. Uh, I don't know why, um, but I've, I've always just found them very interesting, and especially those you know, PVD coated chronographs from the 1980s. Uh, that seemed to be very popular. You know, I'm speaking more of the IWC or Porsche design chronographs, um, and and this Zen is uh, definitely a a watch that um, you know is evocative of that area. It's got the the bezel shaped. Uh, I'm sorry, the barrel shaped case, uh, the white hands, the the bright orange uh, sweep hand and counter hands, um, and uh, man, I just think it's just so cool looking. And uh, I, I found this one on Chrono 24. This was actually a, I think it was either a 30th or 40, 40th uh, anniversary model from Zen. Uh, normally these come with like a blasted um, uh, metal case, but this particular one uh, had the PVD coating and it just, you know, I just saw it and just had to have it. So uh, I purchased it from there and um, uh, had it sent to me from Germany. And it's just a, a watch I just really do enjoy love wearing. Uh, quite a lot. I've I've actually got it mounted here on a on a uh, leather strap, but it came with a very nice uh, metal bracelet. And um, you know, Zen makes great watches, and uh, I, I really do um, I just like looking at this one more than anything. I mean, I do love wearing it, but uh, to me, it's just man, it just uh, does it for me. I I, I feel uh, um, I feel so invigorated just by looking at this thing. So that was a big reason why I got it. All right, um, this is a uh, another recent addition for me, and this is a Zenith El Primero chronograph. Um, this is a um, the 38 millimeter version, and um, you know I I think that you know if you are into chronographs, you have to recognize what Zenith is and what it uh, has meant to the watch industry. I've never owned an El Primero before, 
and uh, you know I was kind of changing th some things up with my collection and decided you know what I need to try one of these things out and see if I really do like it and uh, you know this model with the the tricolor dial and that that sort of outer ring with the uh, with the black section I mean it's just so uh, perfect as far as uh, Zenith's design language and um, you know I just think it's just it, it has such a historical impact as well um, and uh, but more importantly than that for me I, I like wearing it because it's very compact it's it's hard to find a, an automatic chronograph that's, that's 38 millimeters in size that's modern that has a date complication and um, so you know uh, it was something I wasn't really sure I'd like but I, I uh, took the plunge and have just really enjoyed wearing it since I think Zenith is a very underrated brand um, a lot of their products are around the same price as Omega and, and Rolex but they don't get the same sort of press or um, uh, fandom uh, you know in the in the watch collecting community and um, I, I've really enjoyed uh, owning this watch uh, in the past six months or so that I've had it and uh, I will likely keep it in the long term all right this next one is another Zenith uh, so this is the first one I, I purchased uh, and this is the Zenith um, uh, Defy it's the open worked skeletonized dial model uh, I don't have anything in my collection remotely similar to this and so I, I thought you know what I need to get something that's just really unusual very different from from everything else that I owned uh, you can tell by the design it's very much influenced by the AP Royal Oak um, but you know it is its own watch it it it, it does its own thing um, and uh, you know I think Zenith does a, a very good job in um, you know making watches their own and not strictly trying to do something that everyone else is doing uh, this one also has a uh, integrated bracelet uh, which is very beautiful um, the, the finish it has this really nice um, vertical brush finishing on it and uh, the case is also very thin as well it's a titanium watch uh, interestingly enough this is a watch that you really have to uh, at least for me you have to wear kind of tight on the wrist otherwise if you uh, wear it too loose it does have some sharp uh, inner edges on the on the bracelet and uh, it, it will for me at least uh, pull the hairs on my wrist so I, I wear it a little bit tighter than I normally would um, but it's been very comfortable and, and very enjoyable to wear and uh, you know I, man it makes such a, such a statement as well you wear this thing out and people will definitely take notice of it all right this next one for me is the uh, Rolex 16570 this is the uh, Explorer uh, 2 and uh, this is the first Rolex that I ever purchased I purchased this one about five years ago and I, I think a big reason why I purchased it was because I wanted a Rolex sports model but I didn't want to pay a whole lot for it and the the uh, the uh, Explorer 2 models at that time were getting more expensive but they were not anywhere near as expensive as a lot of other models like the GMT Master uh, the black dialed version is is cheaper than the more popular white polar dial version um, but you know still um, I think is is a great value even today uh, you know if you want something that is um, I think you know looks kind of unlike anything else in the market uh, the the um, uh, Rolex Explorer 2 is, is definitely that watch super comfortable to wear um, you know and, and looks good no matter what you're wearing um, it's it's a watch that uh, you know I, I can wear with a suit I can wear with jeans uh, it really does everything and and it's just I think such a classic design uh, it's it's a wonder to me that these things are not more expensive even today um, but it's it's one that I uh, you know took the plunge on and uh, very much enjoy wearing um, you know I've never used the, the the bezel on here before because you know these things were I think initially designed for cave dwellers and that's not something I ever do so uh, you know it's strictly a, a looks thing for me but I, I think it's just a really neat looking watch um, I think either the black or the white dial would make a, a, a great addition if you're considering one as well all right and now we're getting into the uh, keepers in my collection these are the watches that mean the most to me and I'll explain why so the first one on, on this list is a, um, a Rolex Datejust uh, this this particular model is a 16022 and uh, this this watch was owned uh, by my grandfather 
uh, who worked for uh, IBM. Uh, yeah, I mentioned him on the uh, other part of the video. Um, he got this uh, working for IBM. Uh, this was a 25th anniversary present. And there's actually a, a number of these floating out here um, that, that look very similar to this. They all have this sort of silver dial with the uh, stick hands and the engine turn bezel. Um, I had another Rolex uh, Oyster Perpetual 39 that I uh, had owned up until I got this one and I just thought that the two watches were too similar and so I sold the, the Oyster Perpetual 39 and now have this one. Uh, it's 36 millimeters, but honestly that doesn't bother me. I think it's it's just such a beautiful uh, design and it works well you know, with the NATO strap as, as I have it here. It works good on a leather strap. It works good on the the oyster bracelet so uh you know i just really think it's uh, such a neat piece and i love owning it because um you know it came from my grandfather and and um you know my connection with him is is uh, extremely important so uh, this will be one that i'll keep in my collection forever and pass down to a uh, future generation all right this next one here is a tag hoyer monaco um you know i think when i first started sort of getting into the idea of even collecting watches, the Tag Heuer Monaco really stuck out to me quite a lot. Uh, I was already a big fan of Steve McQueen, but, but watching the movie um, Le Mans uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the prominence of this watch in that movie, you know, really sort of um, made me feel like, okay, this is the watch that I need to have. If I'm going to own one watch, this is going to be it. And so I've always sort of lusted after the Tag Heuer Monaco. And uh, this particular watch I got as a wedding present uh, from my father-in-law. And uh, so, you know, it, it does have uh, special meaning for me here. Um, it, it came on a, a very nice uh, leather strap, but I uh, have put it on a uh, Saffiano um, a leather strap that I had custom made uh, from a guy off Etsy. And I just think it looks really nice with this sort of lighter color uh, beige or tan. Uh, and, it, and, you know, the, it has that sort of blue... Um, uh, sunburst dial and the in the white uh, sub markers and and red, uh, you know, there's a lot going on here, but it's just such a classic design. I just think it just looks so beautiful. Um, this is again a watch I'll never sell from my collection because of the uh, the personal uh, attachment it has to an important moment of, in my lifetime. Um, so, okay, this next one here is a watch that I got from my father. Uh, this is a Waltham Bath Escape. Uh, it's a uh, 1960s dive watch, and I think what makes it interesting is the fact that um, this is a rebranded uh, Blanc Pond uh, Bath Escape. So Blanc Pond, um, you know, at this at the the during the late 1960s, was um, you know selling watches to a lot of different markets, and I think at the time that they were selling to the U.S. market. Waltham was probably the, the the more better known brand in the United States, and I would imagine they they made a conscious decision to rebrand their watches for the American market using the Waltham uh, name, which they had purchased um, sometime either in the 1950s or early 1960s. And so this watch, uh, you know, is essentially just a rebranded uh, Blanc Pond, um, and uh, my father <clears throat> received it for his high school graduation from his grandfather. And he wore it for a short time. He said it, it never kept very good time, and uh, and so he had it serviced a couple times, and and uh, you know I think it, it just never really ran that great for him, and so it sat in a box for, gosh, forty years until uh, I started collecting watches. And he said, "Hey, I have this watch. You can come and take a look at it. If I even still have it, I might have thrown it away." And he started digging in a box, and he pulled this one out, and so uh, you know I was so excited when I saw what it was, and. Um, you know, first thing I, I did was had it serviced. I've actually had it serviced a couple times now, uh, and had a, a new crystal put on it. Um, but it, you know, it's just such a, a, a neat piece, and I love the way that the uh, markers on here have uh, have aged perfectly as far as the loom. It's got this real kind of creamy tan loom on it now, uh, and it really uh, contrasts well with this sort of gray sunburst style and then the the black uh, bakelite bezel. So uh, again, this is another one that you know, I'll never sell for my collection. I really do enjoy wearing this because of the connection it has with my dad and my great grandfather. All right, and the last one on this list is a watch that I inherited from my father-in-law. Uh, my father-in-law who uh, gave me the Tag Heuer Monaco, 
uh, sadly passed away about um, five years ago. And uh, this was one of the watches, uh, actually one of the last watches that he purchased. I think once I started getting into watch collecting, uh, it sort of um, made him interested in collecting watches as well. And so uh, I remember he purchased this IWC, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe a few years before he died. And I always thought, man, it's just such a cool looking watch. You know, it's a 1960s era, um, you know, time only manual wind. Um, actually, I take that back. It does have a, an automatic, but it's very thin. Uh, it's not very uh, thick at all. Most of the, the size actually comes from the domed uh, plexi crystal on it. Um, but I just thought, man, this is just such a classic watch. Uh, and, and I thought it was just such a, um, uh, a neat piece when he purchased this. And, um, you know, unfortunately, he passed away. And so his wife, um, you know, told me, uh, that you know if there's a watch in his collection that I would like to own please pick it out and so this was one of the watches that I uh, uh, got from him uh, this one means the most to me and uh, uh, you know it's one that I very much look forward to passing down to my children uh, later on and having inscribed um, uh, because I, I think it's just a really neat memento and it's just so uh, classic looking in its in its design and form so I just really enjoy this one a lot. Um, probably the, the only true dress watch in my collection. And again, one uh, that I will never sell. Anyway, that's all for me. I appreciate you uh, watching. If you have any thoughts or feedback, please uh, post it in the comments below. Thank you so much.